Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome to the second webinar of the Center for Complexity and Biosystems at the University of Milan. We thank you all for your participation. Just uh, some notes before starting. Please uh, um, remind to switch off your microphone during the seminar. If you have questions, uh, please keep them till the end of the seminar when we'll open the discussion time. However, if you have a pressing question that you want to ask to the speaker, which is short and concerns a specific aspect discussed in the slide, you have the possibility to write it in the chat of Zoom. But for a general question, it is better to keep it at the end. We are recording the seminar that will be uploaded on our channels and YouTube afterwards. So you have also the opportunity to watch again some parts if you wish. But now let's start. So today we have a very special talk from a member of our center, Frances von Kloss, who is a mathematician. He did his master in complex systems at King's College London. Then he moved to Barcelona for his PhD, also in the fields of complex systems. And from 2003, he's a postdoc at the Center for Complexity and Biosystems. And today he will talk about the blue frog contribution to cancer metastasis. Please, Fran, go ahead. All right, thanks very much. Thanks very much for this very nice introduction, Silvia. So can you hear me? Yes, can you? Yes, okay, very good, okay. So I'm very happy to be here today with you. And I'm really happy that you decided to join us today. And uh, okay, so today I'm going to talk about blood flow contributions to cancer metastasis. And this is a project we've been working on together with Stefano Zapelli and Caterina Laporta over the last two years. And we've been work working really, really hard on this project. And we're very happy that this is now finally published. And we're really happy that we can finally talk to you about this project. So I'll get started. And so, okay, as, as you all know, metastasis is a process by which, unfortunately, cancer spreads to, to other parts of the body. So, so usually from, from a primary cancer, for instance, here we have a primary cancer. And uh, unfortunately, it happens that cancer can spread to other parts of the body. For instance, you can get metastasis in the liver, or, or in the lungs in this picture. And so how does this happen? So, so basically through the circulatory system or the lymphatic system. So in very simple terms and perhaps simplifying a bit, but what happens is that cancer cells, tumor cells get into the bloodstream and, and they basically travel. They travel through the bloodstream or through the lymphatic system and, and, they, and they then they get attached to another tissue and sometimes you know they grow a, a secondary tumor that's what we call metastasis right and uh, metastasis is really important because uh, most cancer related deaths are due to metastasis so obviously there is there is, is a lot of interest in studying metastasis and one of the aspects that you want to study about metastasis is the what we call metastatic patterns of metastasis and so what is that people know from very long time ago people have realized that you don't get metastasis at random places there are some patterns in the sense that some tumors have more or less tendency to metastasize to certain organs okay and why does that happen so there's there's different there's there's basically two hypotheses okay there's the seat and soul hypothesis which is a more biological hypothesis of, of why we have these patterns, why we have these associations between kinds of cancer and metastatic sites. So where do you get metastasis depending on which kind of cancer you have, okay? And there's the geometry and flow hypothesis, which is more physical. So I will go through them. So the seat and soil hypothesis is a more biological point of view, and it was introduced in 1889 by Paget, and he, he uses this, this very nice analogy of the seed and the soil, where, where the seed would be the tumor cells, and they, they need to find a, a good soil, a good tissue, a good microenvironment that allows them to, to grow. 
So you just cannot grow any seed in any soil, right? So in the same way, uh, so Paget says that, you know, the, the tumor cells need to find a good microenvironment, a good tissue for them to grow. And not all combinations work well. It's all about the biological compatibility, right? Between what kind of tumor cell you have and, and what receiving tissue you have. And there is a lot of evidence supporting this view, of course. And okay, so this is one view. Uh, according to the seed and soil hypothesis, these metastatic patterns, this tendency, this, this frequency of metastasis, right, should depend both on the primary tumor that you have and on the metastatic site that you have. Both things should, are important according to the seed and soil hypothesis, right? Okay, so that is the, in very simple terms, of course, the seed and soil hypothesis. Then there is another view, which is the geometry and flow hypothesis, was introduced by Ewing in 1989. And this view uh, focuses more on, on the mechanical aspects of the circulatory system and on the fact that, that to, to get metastasis, tumor cells need to get to the distant location first. And to get there, they have to travel through the circulatory system and there are constraints. You cannot just go from anywhere to anywhere. And I mean, you ultimately can, but you have to follow the, the vascular system that there is in the body. So I like this analogy of, of, the, of the metro map. So go, to go, for instance, from, from the pancreas to the brain, you have to follow the routes that are available in the body, so the circulatory system. And so it is, it is quite clear from this point of view that the particular topology of the circulatory system could play a role in shaping the distribution of metastasis just because of the fact that, that, the, you know, that the tumor cells travel through the circulatory system. And the second view, of course, it's a more physical point of view. <clears throat> and if you think about it, uh, the two hypotheses can be reconciled together. It's, it's not one or the other. It's not physics or biology. It's probably both things, of course. Both views can coexist. There is a lot of evidence for both points of view and, and you can summarize it. I like to summarize it that way. So for a tumor cell to grow metastasis somewhere, it must first get somewhere and then be able to grow. So, so both things are important, of course, right? You must be able to get somewhere and then you must be able to grow. And so probably a combination of the two things is in place. Also because of the fact that there is supporting evidence for, for both hypotheses. And so if you put the seed and soil hypothesis here and the geometry and flow hypothesis here, and you ask, so what is the role of the biological microenvironment compatibility factors? And what is the role of the mechanical geometric uh, contributions to the metastatic patterns? So we were not happy with just answering it's both. So we decided we wanted to understand this better and we decided we wanted to quantify this. So it's both, but how much? Is it always, are both equally important? Is that weighting always the same? Or perhaps it depends on what kind of cancer. Perhaps we will see that liver cancer perhaps has some weighting here where the seed and soil hypothesis plays a more important role. And perhaps for lung cancer, the, ge the geometry and flow hypothesis plays perhaps the more important role. So we don't know. We would like to answer this question in a quantitative way. And so to do so, we're going to build a detailed model of the circulatory system. And I'm going to walk you through how we build this model. I think it's pretty exciting, even from the technical point of view, that, that we are able to do this nowadays. And the model we are going to build will account only for the geometry and flow part of the problem. And, and that's a very important point here. So we will not model anything that has to do with the seed and soil part of the problem. So we will not introduce any tissue dependent addition. We will not introduce any parameter that accounts for how different cells and tissues interact depending on where they are from. All these would be part of the seed and soil part uh, hypothesis. 
we on purpose will build a model which accounts only for the geometry and flows from for the mechanical part of the problem so where do you go what is the probability to go somewhere when you enter the circulatory system somewhere the point of this is that if we look later at data for metastasis so autopsy data we'll talk about the data later when you look at data <coughs> The two factors are mixed together. When you look at data, you, I mean, autopsy studies are a very good source of information for metastasis because they provide very accurate information. When you do an autopsy, you'll find uh, cancer and, and metastatic sites, even if they were not diagnosed. So, so that's uh, the kind of data we're going to use and it's really useful and it's very accurate and, and we have a lot of them. I will show it, but the problem is that the two factors or all other factors that could be in play are together when you look at the data. What we're going to do is to build a model where we only account for geometry and flow. And in this way, we will be able to disentangle the two things. <coughs> all right, so is it clear so far? If there is any question, please let me know. Uh, so I'm, we'll move ahead. Okay, so we're going to build this model using data from this website. I don't know if you have ever seen this website. It's fantastic. Uh, it's the anatomography website. And it's a very nice website maintained by, by the researchers of the University of Tokyo. And it's meant to, to be used so that you can create anatomical diagrams, three-dimensional, very realistic anatomical diagrams, mostly for educational purposes. So you can see, so the, the so, for, for biology books, Wikipedia articles sometimes have diagrams that have been created with, with this website and so on. It, it's pretty nice. It's a little bit complicated to use uh, because the data itself, it is, it's, it's uh, complicated as well. So these researchers, uh, what did they do? They, they have this very good data set that comes from, from a real male subject and it's from magnetic resonance images with a resolution of two millimeters. So it's really a good resolution. And they have been editing these, these three-dimensional meshes <clears throat> throughout the years, collaborating with researchers and, and fixing little problems that they found in the data. And they keep uh, labeling and taking really care of, of everything. And with years, you know, now the data set is really complete and there's annotations for almost all anatomical sites. It's really complete, okay? And one of the other very nice things of this project is that if you look here, this is the Creative Commons logo. So that means that, that they are happy for us to take the data, the, the data which is behind this website, and they, they are happy for us to use it. And so that's what we did. We said, maybe we can use this data to build our model, okay? So how's this data set looking? It's called the Body Parts 3D data set, and it's, a set of meshes, three-dimensional meshes like this one. So these are some examples. The meshes have a number and so on, okay? And there is a little three-dimensional shape, uh, you know, built out of polygons and triangles and so on, right? And then the data set has also a set of anatomical terms. So which tell you, so if this is the aorta, for instance, or it's an artery or the names of places of anatomical terms, okay? And then there are some relations. And okay, unfortunately, the, the, one, the mapping between meshes and term, anatomical terms is not one to one, but these are you know, technical problems that we can deal with in the end. And uh, the key point here is that we've been able to identify a total of 1,266 meshes that belong to the circulatory system. So all the arteries, main arteries and small arteries, and all the veins and the heart, of course, that form the circulatory system. So it's more than a thousand meshes. And we want to use those meshes that conform the circulatory system to build a model of a circulatory system. But we don't want to work with, with the meshes, okay? We, we would like to transform those meshes to, to a graph, okay? We want to have a coarse-grained view of the mesh. The mesh has extra information that we don't, don't need, actually, okay? We want to get the coarse grain view, so to say. 
<clears throat> and, and to do this, we use this, this algorithm, which is called LPI graph, and we modify a little, a little bit. <clears throat> and, and we want to transform this, all these 1000 measures into graphs. Okay. And how do you do it? Okay. So this algorithm was, was built for single cell data sets. Mm. And uh, you basically sample some points on the surface of the mesh. Okay, so you, you sample some points here on the surface of the mesh and then feed those points to the algorithm, LPI graph by Albergante and collaborators and who have uh, published the code. So thanks very much to Albergante and collaborators because it's been really useful for us. Okay, and, and then you get a first candidate for, for the mesh. And in addition, of course, you keep track of the original positions of the nodes. And we want to get annotations for the diameters of the vessels. So it will be very important for us to have this information of what is the diameter, the radii of the vessels. Okay, so this is a small seg segment of a, an artery, for instance. We want to keep track of this. <clears throat> now, because the diameter of vessels changes, you know, you need to keep all these intermediate nodes here to be able to, to keep track of the diameter that can change throughout the vessel, okay? So the topological structure is, is not enough. You need something more. You need, you need to keep track of this. You need to add as many intermediate nodes as necessary so that, you know, you end up with a segment which is short enough so that the constant diameter on this short segment is a good approximation, okay? So the diameter of the vessel changes, but we, we put some intermediate nodes and then for each section, then we are happy with saying that the diameter is constant at each section. And how do you measure it? Actually, for each little section, you actually go and measure the diameter fitting a disc, okay? So it should be perpendicular to the edge and interior to the mesh and, and so on. And, but perhaps the key point here or the key message is that on average, we measure the vessel diameter at around 17 different locations for each mesh, okay? So we've been really careful about measuring the diameter with very accuracy, with a lot of accuracy. This gives a total of 21,555 measurements of the diameter of vessels over the whole circulatory system. So, so that's a lot. We were really careful of that because the diameter is it's a key component of our model, okay? So how does the, the whole mesh to graph conversion work? So we basically start with a mesh and fit some points to the LPI graph algorithm. And that gives you one proposal. Then that's the second step. It's the human verification. So we go and look at the resulting structure and we check that it is correct. And sometimes it's correct, sometimes it's not. If it's correct, we go ahead and measure the diameter as I, as I showed now. And if it's not, we do this thing of splitting it in two chunks and going it, doing it together. So I think it's easier if I show an example. So we, have, we actually had to build this software for ourselves for, to do this process. So this mesh was very simple, okay? And so the algorithm proposes this graph. So you take a look. You can rotate it, not now, but in the real software, you can rotate it and you say, okay, that is correct. Is the topology okay? Yes. So you go measure the diameters and move to the next one. The next one is a little bit more complicated, but the algorithm also got that one right. So we move ahead. However, sometimes, you know, the algorithm does not work well, okay? So in that case, you split the mesh in two chunks and do it again for each chunk separately. And you do this process over and over until you are left with a piece of mesh that is simple enough for the algorithm to deal with it. And some, eventually you get the right topology. So you verify visually that this topology is correct for the mesh that you are trying to convert. And then you continue. Okay, and we did that for 1,266 graphs. And we were really careful to make sure that the topology was correct because we, we need to have the correct topology of the circulatory system. 
<coughs> sorry. Okay, so when we have these 100, 1000 graphs, what we do is to put them together. And so basically we join graphs when the corresponding meshes intersect. Okay, and we also verify manually that the connections are sound. And so we again look at the connections and verify that they are really connecting. Okay, that they should be connecting where they connect. We also add connections between arteries and veins at leaf points when they are close to each other. And in summary, so far, after all this tedious technical process, we get to this final object, which is a giant graph of the circulatory system with 23,000 nodes with the position in three-dimensional space associated to it. 24,000 edges, each with the diameter of it annotated, okay? And it has two con connected components that divide the, the main and the pulmonary systems. Okay, so summary so far, we have this giant graph of the circulatory system and it's really been carefully annotated. So, so this is a little bit an illustration of what we have so far, okay? We have, of course, it's 24,000 nodes, but this is an illustration, okay? So we have arteries here. So, you know, the heart is pumping blood through your arteries and uh, there's certain pressure because the heart is, is creating a war, right? Uh, so it, there's a pressure. <clears throat> so at each node, we have some pressure and you have a flow that of blood through the edges. And, and we would like to know what is this flow, okay? To the soul, okay, to solve now the system and, and, and know what is the flow of blood through each edge of the graph, we have to make some assumptions, okay? So, of course, uh, I mean, the physicists in, in the room know that, that, that uh, flow, flow equations can be very complicated and uh, flow dynamics, uh, you know, you have laminar flow and turbulent flow and so on. And of course we have to simplify things a lot, otherwise it would be impossible to solve the, this system. So we already have a graph which simplifies things. And now, <clears throat> in addition, we will assume that, that blood is a Newtonian fluid of constant viscosity, which is sort of okay in some ranges. We assume that vessels are non-deformable, that is that, that the, the action of blood flowing through them, the pressure is not changing the shape. This is totally not true, of course, uh, uh, fortunately, but otherwise they would break easily. Uh, they are a little bit deformable, but that's our approximation. We can, we, we can it's difficult, right, to, to modify the shapes that we already have. <clears throat> okay, another approximation is that we assume a constant arterial pressure. So as you know, the heart has these systolic diastolic pressure changes where because it's pumping, pump, 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 right? And so the pressure is not constant, it has this cycle. However, we assume a constant arterial pressure and, and that is going to be okay over the time scales that we are interested in, which are much longer time scales. So heart is pumping at time scales of seconds and we are not going to look at these short time scales. So that's okay in that sense. And finally, we're going to add these this resistive elements here between arteries and veins. And these resistive elements, <clears throat> use, we use them to connect the system and make it that it's closed loop, of course, and then to account for everything that could be missing, okay? So, of course, the, the picture that we have of the circulatory system, we think it's quite complete, but not everything is there. So, for instance, the resistance of fluid through the capillary beds we, we cannot see that's not on the scale of two millimeters of our resolution, of course. And so there's, there's missing information in a way. And these uh, uh, resistive elements that we add here will be used to account for, for the missing uh, parts, the tiny things, let's say. Okay, so with these uh, assumptions, now we can solve this system as follows. So what we are interested here the main variables that we care about are the flow of blood along the edge. So in simple terms, how much blood is flowing through each edge? Is it going all to this side or to the other side, right? And so you have the Hagen-Poiseuille equation which relates the flow rate with 
the pressure difference, okay, and it also needs the radius. And so that's why it was so important for us to get very precisely the diameter of the meshes at, in very short sections with, with, with high accuracy, okay? We need to know very well what is the diameter of the, of the meshes to be able to use now the hagen fossil equation. And now we, we, we can use this equation. Okay, we have also flow conservation at nodes. That is quite clear. So everything that gets in the node should be out. You cannot just create a blot or lose it down the drain. All right, so that's clear. The flow should be conserved at the nodes. And the pressure difference is the difference of pressure. Okay, so if you put these three equations together, one, two, three, these three equations here, uh, I forgot to say, sorry, so eta is the viscosity, but we assume it's constant, so it doesn't play a very important role in the end. Uh, okay, so if you put these three equations together, you get one of these equations for each node, so 24,000 of these equations, right? One for each node. The good thing is that it's a linear equation in the end, so we can solve it, right? So we do it. And after solving it, that's what we get. We have to adjust those resistances I was talking about to match what's called the, the known blood flow fraction to the organs. And what is the blood flow fraction? So for instance, it is well known what is the fraction of blood that goes to the organ. So people know that uh, it has been studied in detail that uh, the herd gets around uh, five, one, two, three, four percent or 5% of the, of the total blood volume, okay? And instead the brain gets, gets more and so on, and the stomach gets less, right? And so these values, uh, we want to match those. <clears throat> we need to have a, a model that basically carries the right amount of blood to the different organs, okay? And, and, and so we match this using those uh, resistances that we still have to play with. Okay, so, and, and so this accounts for the missing parts that we cannot get in the meshes. So we match the known blood flow fraction to organs. And now what do we have? So we have a graph of the circulatory system with the position of the nodes. We have the diameter of the, of the edges of the vessels. And now in addition, we have the flow of each edge. And, and that's really good, right? That, that's what we wanted, of course. And why? Because if you know the flow of the edges, you can now start building uh, the model, okay? So we're going to build this model. It's going to be simple, okay? Basically, if you know the flow now, assuming laminar flow, you can know what's the average velocity of blood along each edge. And that velocity changes because it depends on the flow and so on, okay? So we're going to release these little particles uh, that simulate the circulating tumor cells. We're going to release them at, at some primary organ and we let them flow through the system, okay? And how do they flow through the system? They follow blood, okay, along the edges. And we have to think about a couple of things, okay? So the first thing we have to decide is what to do when a particle or a tracer, uh, one of these little circulating tumor cells, finds a branching point. So we make the model to be stochastic. We make the, the circulating tumor cell to choose a branch randomly, but with probabilities that are proportional to the flow that we have. So that it means that if most of the blood is going through that branch, for instance, if most of the blood here is going through J2, then we will make the particle to choose that branch with more probability. So it's more likely that you take the branch where most of the flow is going. And so that, that makes a lot of sense if you think about it. <clears throat> and the second thing that we need to decide is how to model the, the vision of this model. So when to make, how, how is the simulation going to finish? So when do they stop the particles? Otherwise, if you don't put uh, this, they flow around and around forever, okay? So what we decided was to model it in this way. So we put a constant addition probability uh, throughout the body, which is constant. And the only thing that we say is that you can only attach to the wall of the vessel if you are very close to it, 
Okay, so that's reasonable. You need to be close to the wall to attach to it, right? And so if you are at a distance less than delta of the wall, then there is some probability that you attach to it. If you are in the middle, you cannot attach, okay? And assuming laminar flow again and so on, you can, you can analytically work out this probability and, and that's the expression you get. And that is telling you basically in silver terms that when you go through a thicker vessel, it is less likely that you attach to the wall, okay? Because, you know, you are going through the middle. When you go through a thin vessel, it's easier for you to attach to the wall, okay? Okay. So now I'm, I'm going to show a, a video that we prepared uh, uh, to illustrate how this simulation works. So I'm going to explain it a little bit before. So we, we basically release, uh, I think in the video, around 40 little circulating tumor cells from the pancreas and they, those will be in color yellow. Okay, and you will see they start to travel around the circulatory system and they, go, they will first go up the vena cava and then they will spread all over the, the body. Okay, and then eventually they, they stop. Okay, so let, let me see. All right. So this is the, the, the data from the body parts for the data set. And there's some like, and you see here the pancreas and up they go. You see them going up the vena cava and now they get to the heart and they start moving around. You see here, some are going to the brain, others are going down the legs now. So this is a visualization, but the data for the particles is really from the simulations. All right, so, okay, so now what we do is the following. So we launch 10,000 of those little yellow dots from each of these primary organs. So 10,000 from the brain, 10,000 from the kidney and so on. Of course, we don't need to do the video for, for each of these cases, but we do the simulations, of course. And then we take note, we compute the statistics or where do they stop, okay? So when the, the particles stop, sometimes they stop nowhere, so not near an organ, and sometimes they stop close to an organ, okay? Close to a metastatic site. What does close mean? So we consider a vicinity factor of 10 millimeters, okay? So if a particle stops, so adheres to the wall with the probabilities that we, I just showed, at less than 10 millimeters from the liver, for instance, we annotate that that simulation reached the liver, okay? So, summarizing, okay, we, we have this, uh, if you want, this A to B transfer matrix probability, okay? But it's good to remind all the work that is behind this matrix. So, there's all these meshes that we convert to graphs, that we put the graphs together, we solve the equations of flow, and then we have the velocities, we have the branching ratios, let's say, and we simulate 10,000 uh, particles from each primary organ and just observe where do they go. And this is what we call the fraction of cells, okay? So the fraction of cells is what fraction of cells that we launch from the kidney, for instance, okay, did actually finish the simulation, did, did actually adhere to the walls close to the lungs, for instance. So that's this value, okay? Okay, now we're going to, okay, sorry. Okay, so if there's any questions so far, I could also reply the questions. Okay, so now we turn to data, okay? So we also collected uh, some data. We focus on autopsy data. Why autopsy data? Well. So there's uh, different kinds of records of metastasis and some studies use um, clinical records and diagnosis and, and other methods 
which can give you a lot of records, but with less accuracy, in the sense that with diagnosis, even if you get the data for all the health system of a country, which little country, which has happened, you only know the diagnosed cases, okay? Uh, and we found that that was not working so well. Instead, when you look at autopsy data, autopsy data, basically, uh, you find the metastasis even when it was not diagnosed. And that's really good. So you know that there's, there's a lot of metastasis that people have and do not know about. When, so not all metastases are diagnosed, unfortunately. And so during uh, autopsy, these cases are usually identified, or at least we, we know that with much more usually. So we went to collect autopsy data from the major autopsy, big autopsy studies that we could find. And we, ha we had to go back in time up to 1950. Uh, uh, and so there were some tables that we had to digitize and so on. And we, we took care of really carefully putting all these data together and making it available now. So if, if you are interested, we already did this work of putting all these data together and now it's on our repositories. If you perhaps want to do research on metastatic patterns. And okay, so you can imagine that putting this data together is not easy, but so there are some complications, okay. And so this is a little overview of what is in the data. So some studies uh, focus on one type of cancer, like uh, this one, Babendorf. This is prostate cancer, for instance. Others uh, study many cancers and so on. Some record, okay, for instance, you see here, Abrams makes note of 39 different metastatic sites, okay. Uh, Babendorf is less detailed, only has annotations for 17 sites, okay. and. Sorry, and, and this CPU instead it uses 30 different locations. So you can imagine that, that putting all these annotations together was not totally straightforward, but we, we think did a good job there as well. And so in all together, we reached the, the, the number of 6,542 autopsy cases. Okay, so that is enough to get uh, reliable statistics. And so the first thing that we do with this data is to look at the consistency, okay? So we compare the estimates that different publications give and, and we have this picture where, where we see some clear consistency, okay? So for instance, you see here, so of course there is differences, okay? So different studies, totally independent studies give consistent but not exactly equal result, uh, estimates of of what is this? So this is the fraction of patients that had pancreatic cancer and that had metastasis in the lungs, for instance, okay? So for this value here, uh, the, the estimates are not exactly equal, but they are consistent with each other, at least mostly. Now, there's many reasons why you could have differences. We do not expect that these numbers should be exactly equal. And of course, the populations that these publications are studying are different. They have different clinical histories. They were happening at different time points in history, so different drug treatments were available. Perhaps the autopsy was done in a slightly different way, of course. Uh, perhaps, and, and this is the one, the most troubling one, I think the, the site annotation is, is not uniform, and so sometimes it's a bit difficult to put these things together, okay? And so we do not expect a perfect match. But we were happy to see that overall there was a very remarkable consistency between these totally independent uh, studies. So summarizing, so we have exactly so different kinds of cancer and, and always we find this, this consistency, right? Sometimes there are some important differences, but overall it's quite consistent. So summarizing, we thought that this data can be trusted and, and so we're going to use it now. Okay, so this is my summary slide for what we've done so far. So I'm gonna take a deep breath. So what have we done so far? So on the, on the modeling side, we started from body parts 3D, which is a data set of uh, 
three-dimensional meshes of the body, basically. We did this, this graph inference process where you take a mesh and you get a graph out of it, and we, we joined those together, okay, and created this circulation model. We added some elements for, for, for the simulations, and we, we model adhesion uniformly throughout the body, okay, so without taking into account any seed and soil kind of uh, interaction, okay, so adhesion happens uniformly throughout the body, okay, and in the end, we reach this final object, which is the A to B probability matrix, right, which is the, tells you what is our estimate for the probability to get metastasis at different sites, depending on which kind of cancer you are talking about. All right. On the other side, we took some data from autopsy studies as much as we could. Okay, we put those together, taking care of some heterogeneity. We verified that at least the values we were getting were consistent over different publications, so we think they can be trusted. And so that leads you to uh, at the same object, okay, but from the data. And so now we're going to compare them. Okay, so let's compare them and. So this is the, the main result of, of this project, perhaps, or one of the main results of this project. And this is a comparison between the metastatic frequency of different cancers, okay? So I'm going to perhaps walk you through how to read one of these plots, okay? So we're looking at lung cancer now, okay? We focus on lung cancer, very good. And on the y-axis, you have the fraction of patients that presented metastasis at different sites, okay? And you see how that fraction of patients varies very much over two orders of magnitude. So from 10 to the, so from one to, to the probability of 1% only, okay? So that's telling you that this, this probability of getting metastasis is not uniform, it's not random, it's much higher on some sites than on others. Some sites have probability of maybe 30, 40%, and others have only 1%, okay? And that is the fraction of patients. On the x-axis, you have the same quantity estimated with the circulate with our model, okay? So that's the fraction of, of cells, of, of little tracers that we saw in the video of those little dots that started at the lungs, and metastasize to different places, okay? And, and you see, okay, that there is certain agreement, okay? So on the y-axis, you have the data, and on the x-axis, you have the model, okay? And now, here, one interesting point is to notice that different cancers give different levels of agreement, if you wish, okay? So apparently for, for lung cancer, we have a very good uh, agreement, you know, R2 is 0.82. I think this is truly remarkable, uh, to be honest. We remind, and in other cases, however, that's not the case, okay? For liver cancer, it doesn't seem that the model explains very well the data that we have. Now, there's a few points to make here, I think. One is that the model is the same for all cancers. There is no feed of the model to the data, and there is no parameter that depends neither on the kind of cancer nor on the metastatic site that you are looking at. So there's just one model. The model is not connected in any way with the data, besides the comparison, of course. So I find these correlations truly remarkable. A second point to make here is that the model accounts only for the geometry of the circulatory system and on purpose does not account for any biological compatibility factors, does not account for the seed and soil part of the problem. So we do not expect uh, to find a perfect match, not at all, of course. And the interesting point is that we find different results for different cancers. I think these points are, are also, can also be seen from, from this more mathematical or, or statistical point of view, okay? So you have some variability in the data. S2 is the variability of the data. So the variability of the fraction of patients for a given cancer, okay? 
And you can decompose that in the classic way where you have a model and so you have the unexplained variability, this E squared, okay? And then you have, so this first bit is the fraction of variability that the model can explain. And we attribute that to the geometry and flow hypothesis because the model can only by construction explain the geometry and flow. We have some measurement error, okay? This comes from the fact that each of these points, each of these points has some error bars because each point comes from a study. That study had certain number of patients. And so this gives you an error bar of how sure you are about the estimate that you've done of the fraction of patients, okay? And so you can actually take into account this error, measurement error, if you wish here, okay? And so that measurement error creates some variability in the data as well, okay? So that's the, the gray bit here. And everything else that the model cannot account for, we generously, let's say, attribute to the seed and soil hypothesis, okay? So we can also look at this plot here. Okay, so we have, we have this bar here that represents the variability of the frequency of patients that get metastasis in different sites for lung cancer. And that variability is divided into true bit, into three bits, sorry. So there's this little gray bit here, which is the measurement error. Okay, then there is this, this black, this red part here, which is the part of the variability that the model can account for. And then there is this one, which is not accounted for by the model. And again, I insist uh, the model is always the same. So the simulations are always the same and there is no tuning of the model towards the data or there is no parameter that depends on what kind of cancer or that depends on the metastatic site. And in this sense, we are quite sure that all the variability of the data that the model can account for is explained by geometry of flow because we did not incorporate anything else into the model. That's the kind of reasoning that we are doing here. Okay. And uh, so, yes, before going to the model limitations, uh, yes, so, uh, so, still looking at this plot or perhaps at this one as well. So you notice that we have different results here. So lung cancer, for instance, gives very good agreement, okay? So you see 82% of the variability of the data is explained by the model. So we would say, we would say that for lung cancer, the geometry and flow plays a very important role and sit and soil less, okay? Instead, interestingly, for liver cancer, the model cannot explain almost none of the variability that we see in the data, and that's fine, and that means that in that case, there must be other factors, and uh, of course, we, we, we think those other factors should be the seed and soil biological point of view, so the compatibility between different tissues. So for liver cancer, that seems to be very important, and the model based on geometry only cannot account for the data that we see in autopsy, at least on the autopsy data we, we were able to, to put together. So now, ah yes, okay. So long, we didn't talk a lot about model limitations. Of course, there's a lot of limitations uh, and limitations are also what allowed us to, to, to finally reach the, the results, however. So for instance, the lymphatic system is missing. We know that in, in particular cases, uh, it is known that certain metastases are actually through the lymphatic system and we, we cannot account for those. So that's a third factor that you could also put here perhaps and liver cancer perhaps. Perhaps the lymphatic system is very important in that case and that's why we cannot account for, for the data that we see, okay? Other limitations, I think perhaps less important but also limitations of course is the fact that we don't take into account gravity or the fact that so the fact that the, the veins actually have some valves that help you pump the blood upstream and there's some mu muscle movement so to say to help you pump the, the blood upstream 
We did not model these aspects of blood circulation. We did not include the systolic diastolic cycle of the herd. This would be necessary if you were interested in, in shorter time scales. There's the fact that also that all the unexplained variance is, is attributed to the sit and sol hypothesis. And uh, of course, there could be a third factor that is neither geometry flow nor sit and soil that could get a share of this variability. So we did not take into account other possibilities. And finally, there's the, there's the limiting fact, admittedly limiting fact that all the data comes from a single individual. By the way, it's known as Taro. And, and, and this is true and it's somewhat limiting, but the, the bright side of this is that the data, data that we have is from a real individual and it's extremely detailed and, and, and actually it leads to, to very interesting results in, in our opinion. So to conclude, uh, we've been able to build a detailed model of the circulatory system from three-dimensional three -dimensional mesh data which uh, is available for everyone to download now and play with it and hopefully uh, do other research with it. We could quantify what is the contribution of blood flow to cancer metastasis for different cancers. And we find values that range from only 9%, for instance, in the case of liver cancer, up to 82% in the case of lung cancer. And so I guess the final conclusion is that both the sit and soil and the geometry and flow hypotheses are important to, to explain metastatic patterns. So it's not physics or biology, of course it's both. Now we can quantify how much for, for different cases. Okay, so <coughs> that's it. Uh, I want to thank everyone that took part on this project, in this case Stefano Zapperi and Caterina Laporta. So we've been working on this for two years, really hard, and we're really happy that this is now published. And we're also happy to to put all the results on our GitHub. So we have published everything and that includes, okay, that includes all the, all the graph. So the, the full graph with 24,000 nodes uh, solved. That includes all the autopsy data that we compiled. So 6,000 cases. So you don't have to go through those publications again. It, it's there already. And that includes the code, Python code to run the simulations, and even some scripts to render some animations as our video. So we, we, we will be happy if you have some feedback for us. Please uh, read the paper, share with your colleagues, and, and reach to us. And, and, and OK, so thanks very much, everyone, for listening. Uh, I'll be happy to take questions now. Thank you very much, Frances, for your uh, very interesting presentation. Now it's time for questions, so you can raise your hand and uh, let's start.